Good afternoon, Pastor David. How you doing, John? Welcome everybody to a random moment, unfiltered with Pastor David. Uh, church family, as you guys are tuning in, you know on Tuesdays we we like to keep current events on what's going around uh, around us, and, and on Thursdays we want to stick to topics that pertain to the church. And so today, Pastor, I wanted to ask you about churches that, not even, I mean, not so much in the local area, but just churches in general that have Christian doctrine, they're uh, considered orthodox doctrine. Are there churches out there who, who come from this doctrine that can be considered cultic? There, there are, well, that's a good question. Um, are there churches that are, 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 that can be considered cultic even though they have proper or correct doctrine? Correct. I, I, yeah, I, I would say yeah, because uh, cultic is a word that can be used not only to express um, aberrational doctrine, you know, denying the uh, the uh, the scriptural truth that Jesus is God in the flesh, for example, or the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, and things of that nature. Um, that would be considered what would be called orthodox Christian doctrine, the the inspiration of Scripture, and um, you know, even the establishment of the church and things that relate to it that have been traditionally held for 2,000 years. There are, there are forms and structures that you find in Scripture that help us to parallel uh, developing our, our way of ministry, we'll say, uh, in a way that is consistent with our environment and things of that nature. But there are certain essentials that you would find uh, that would make up, we'll say, an Orthodox church. The doctrine, the teaching, obviously, who Jesus is, what Jesus did, how to be saved, the return of Jesus Christ, things of that nature. Those are things that are called uh, essentials. And then there are the peripheral, the things that relate, we'll say, to when you have communion and how you have communion or when you have baptisms and whether you sprinkle or whether you, you dunk and all of that. Those things would be peripheral, even though they f fit within the framework of, of um, essential Christian truth. And so you can have a, a church that is teaching essential Christian truth, but still have a form of cultism uh, when you begin to look, for example, at um, at the cults or the classic definition related to cults, you know the cults uh, will always have a a single leader, uh, a leader that is claiming to hear from God the things that uh, we must know now. Charles Taze Russell with the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, um, Mary Baker Eddy, you know, things of that nature were. were they were people who said, I've received some knowledge that I need to dispense to you. And then they created an entire system that was around them as the supreme leader. So you have things like that. Um, that, that falls into more of a, of a uh, cultic activity. Uh, they would have extra biblical material. You know, they have the documents that have been inspired, they say, from from God and given to them, and so you have the New World Translation of the of the Scriptures, which uh, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses claim to be uh, orthodox, when in fact they don't have a single scholar that translated, and they won't admit to who even did the translations. Things of that nature, where they change Scriptures to meet their their doctrinal uh, aberrational teachings. So you have you have classic cults, and then you have churches that have orthodoxy at its root but have a form that makes it a single person centered kind of experience and when you have a church that has a single person kind of like the head the leader that the people follow after and and he or she um acts out that role by saying to the church i've told you this and you know this and i have or they're always the center of their stories, or the, you know they're always a hero of their own illustrations and things of that nature. Yeah, you're moving into a sociological definition of cult, you know, where you're pursuing a single leader who becomes your source of truth. And uh, even when they're saying, I'm giving you scripture, they still remain the center of the Bible study. And you walk out saying, what a wonderful person this is, 
rather than what a wonderful savior we have. And mm-hmm. so that, yeah, I believe that happens, and I think it it happens more often than we care to admit. And with that, you know, what it when it, it will look like a church, it will sound like a church, but in in reality, uh, it can be cultic. How do is it when that happens? Uh, do the people follow suit to the, the congregation? Quote well, unquote. the congregation becomes very, very defensive of their leader. So he cannot be criticized. What he says cannot be checked. What he says cannot be uh, looked at closely and determined as to whether or not these things are accurate. And yeah, that happens all the time. And I've seen it. I've been a Christian for a long time, John, so I've seen it for a long time that there are those who go to a church because uh, because they like what they get from it and they like the one who's giving to them what they want to hear. And so if you say, but but what was taught is not accurate, it's not, well, that's your opinion. Hmm. You know, and oh, you're just jealous because I've heard that before. And I, I think that's a common thing that's, you know, here in the United States, at least more than likely is this a very human reaction to to the defensiveness people can have when they follow somebody that cannot be uh, corrected. Right. And all they have to do is start serve, serving some Kool-Aid next and then... Uh... Well, you know what? In the extreme, unfortunately, that's what happens, you know. It, it, I, I get more concerned with the, with, the, um, with the church in these latter days. It's the members of the church are seeking someone who will speak what they believe. And so they'll find somebody who says what they believe and he says it loudly or portrays himself as being the only one who does such a thing. Mm-hmm. And before you know it, they're very defensive for their leader when in fact this person isn't pointing you to the Lord. He's pointing you to his opinions or what he says is true. And that's very dangerous. Yeah. Well, Pastor, thank you so much for sharing that uh, with us. And uh, and to always, you know, it's always good to do your homework when whatever church you go to, to see if they're teaching the word of God. If man's not elevated, but Jesus Christ is elevated. Mm-hmm. and. And, uh, and so thank you for that, Pastor. Just a couple of things that are coming up, you guys, that we want to invite you to. We have our Sunday morning services at 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m. and 10.45. Pastor's taking us through Mark. I think you're in chapter... Chapter 8. eight. And uh, look forward to that. And want to invite you uh, to come on out. Actually, oh, I'm sorry. Chapter 7, verses 31 through 37. I oh, was that's preparing right. my chapter 8 just now. That's so right. Chapter 7. <laughs> it's going to be chapter 7. I'm going to see in the notes. And then uh, next week, it looks like we have communion uh, next Wednesday. On Wednesday so night. Yeah. We look forward to having you guys come out as pastors taking us through the book of Ephesians. And then, men, we have our Super Bowl breakfast on February 5th at 8.30. Uh, I'd like to have you guys come out. We have our tickets on sale at the gazebo, or you can register online. And so invite your friends and family. Uh, we do have the privilege of coming to church. So, again, invite your friends and family to come out and join us. And, Pastor, thank you so much for this time. And thank you guys for tuning in. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.